Good morning, everybody. It's an honor and a privilege to be here. Thank you, Pastor Jeff, for opening your pulpit for me. And as Pastor Jeff said, I'm a full-time missionary, and when I first met Pastor Jeff, I was with Ratio Christi, which is Latin for the reason of Christ. And that ministry is focused on apologetics and starting apologetics clubs on campuses. Many of you probably heard about Campus Crusade for Christ, better known as Crew now. Well, they focus on sharing the gospel with people and Bible studies and so on. But Ratio Christi focused on apologetics. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 says, Always be prepared to give a defense or a reason for the hope that lies within you, but do it with gentleness and respect. So because of the fall-away rate, which is going on out there, and that is about, by the time they're 22 years old or after they've left high school, about 80% of church-going youth just completely leave the church. About a quarter of university and college professors are either atheists or agnostics, and they're challenging these students on campus. Many times the kids go off to school after they've been raised up in the church, they're challenged by atheists or agnostic professors or students and so on, and they come home on vacation and say, Mom and Dad, I'm not a Christian anymore. Because guess what? My professor had answers and had evidence on why Christianity is false. So that's the ministry that I started with. And I was a part of the national staff, and we set up hundreds of chapters on campuses throughout the world. But in the summer of 2018, my friend Joe Carey died. And he was the founder of Radical Truth, which focuses on reaching Muslims with the gospel and equipping Christians to do the same. And my personal area of study of of major focus was Islam, in addition to just general apologetics and evangelism. So his wife prayed, like, who can the Lord use to continue this ministry? So at the end of 2018, I left Rosho Christi, uh, January 1st, 2019, I joined Radical Truth, and now... Islam is our focus because you can't get a bigger mission field than Muslims. When you're talking Jehovah's Witnesses, 8, 9 million throughout the world. Muslims, 1.6 billion throughout the world. So if you care about the lost, well, you can't find a bigger mission field than Muslims. However, no surprise, some churches just either don't want stuff on Islam at all Or if they do, they'll say, okay, just come in and talk about sharing the gospel with Muslims. Or they'll say, hey, come in and just tell people why Islam is false and give us all the evidence and apologetics and polemics and all that stuff. But you know what? If you're not comfortable and confident to share the gospel in general, you're not going to have a Muslim as number one on your list of people to reach out to. And maybe not even a Mormon or Jehovah's Witness, etc., So our main goal of the ministry is the gospel, because that's the power of God unto salvation. Once you're comfortable sharing the gospel in general, then you can choose, okay, this is the particular non-Christian group I want to focus on. So as a ministry, we're focused on reaching Muslims with the truth of the gospel and exposing Islam, but overall, our goal is just sharing the gospel in general. And that's what I want to help all of you do this morning, is get better equipped and confident to just share the gospel in general. And if you have a group of people who you reach out to, great. If not, this will get you equipped to just reach out in general. And I want to ask you, this is just a question to ask yourself. How many times have you shared the gospel in the last year? Zero to five times? Ten to fifty? Over a hundred? Whatever answer you have, after this training today, which is actually just a summary of our full four-hour training, I guarantee that you will be able to easily share the gospel, each one of you, with hundreds of people every single year. Brad, I've got a friend who's not a Christian, and I was just hoping that maybe you could talk to him a little bit, see what happens, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, you know... I, I could, but yeah. uh, I think I have a better idea, Shane. What's that? Why don't you think about sharing your faith with him yourself? No! I can't. I can't. I can't. Why? 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 Shane! Why? No, Shane! Yeah? Shane, what is the problem, man? Get a, get a grip! Brad, you don't understand. What, what are you talking about? I can't do it. Y- you can do it. 
I can't do it. You've got to do it. I can't. Why can't you do it? Well, Brad, I've been giving it some thought, and yeah, and there's eight reasons. Eight reasons? Eight reasons why you can't share your faith. Why I can't share my faith. Well, tell me about it. Okay. You know, the eighth reason why I can't share my faith is, well, I'm afraid I might get beat up. Excuse me, guy. You guys heard about Jesus? Jesus? Yeah. I don't want to hear that. Hey, Jesus loves you guys, man. He really oh, does. Man. He really loves you. Reason number seven. <laughs> I'm afraid I won't make any sense. You know what? I don't care if you have five kids. You're fired. Hold on a minute, Mom. Excuse me, sir. Um, Jesus, have you heart what? the clouds and um, peas porridge what? hot? Um, I'm sorry, I don't have time. There's please. in between. You know what? What am I doing? I don't know what I'm saying. I knew this was going to be this way. It's always this way. Reason number six. Well, I'm afraid I might get made fun of. Hey, so have you guys, uh, you heard about Jesus before? Jesus? Jesus? Yeah. What, what the heck? You know. Look at this Are guy. Are you Christian? such a loser, you Nice jacket! Dude, nice but haircut, you, you cut that yourself. Yeah, yeah, you guys, you guys, 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 What is up with this, man? On, hey, I like those pants, I got this dude. jerk like over so here trying to tell me about Jesus. This one in this door. Yeah, go away. I can't believe it. Look at him! <laughs> Reason number five is, I just don't know how to get started. That's all there is to it. Excuse me, ma'am. I wanted to... The fourth reason why I'm afraid to share my faith is, well, I'm afraid I'm going to be a bad witness because I do stupid bad things sometimes. What do you think you're doing? I'm sitting here trying to smoke my flippin' cigarette. You come walking into me like you got some kind of problem. You stupid jerk, you son of a crud. Take a hike, man. Excuse me, brother. Have you heard about Jesus? The third reason why I'm afraid to share my faith is, well, I'm afraid I might say the wrong thing and send somebody to hell. Shane, I want to be forgiven of my sin. I want to receive Christ. Dude, that is awesome, man. There's just one thing I want to confirm to you first. What's that? That's the Buddha, you know, he was the sacred cow who ate the golden tablets and he doesn't believe in birthdays. Doesn't, you're right. You're a wise man, Shane. Mecca. This is awesome. Hey, guys. What guys, I, I got some good news. None of that's guys, true. Guys, No! Stop! The second reason why I don't share my faith is I don't want people to think I'm a religious nut. Sir? Yeah? I'd like to talk to you a little bit about Jesus. Jesus? Yeah. I know your type. You're one of those religious, right-wing, fanatic, Nazi, baby-loving, anti-choice, homophobic freaks. So. Oh, oh, yes, you are! You! You are so judgmental! What about my self-esteem? What about my feelings? Nobody cares. And the number one reason why I don't share my faith is because I don't know enough. And what if somebody asks me a question and I don't know the answer? Then what? Then what do I do? Shane, I'm ready to receive the salvation. Cool. But I just got one last question. What's that? How does transubstantiation correspond with the ecclesiastical movement to eschatological events? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. He's going to hell. He's going to hell. Well, you know, Shana, thanks for sharing those reasons so vividly, but 
You know, they're, they're not really reasons. They're excuses. I think you're right. Let's go. I know I'm right. If you're a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, it is your job to share the God-glorifying gospel with people around you. However, today I want to build your confidence and help equip and encourage you to share the gospel to the, with those who need to know and understand it. So he need, who needs to know and understand the gospel? Everybody. In Romans 1.16, Paul said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. But what is the number one emotion that hinders many people from sharing the gospel? Fear. Fear is powerful, isn't it? There's actually a direct correlation between fear and how often a Christian shares his or her faith. A number of years ago, Bill Bright, the founder of Campus Crusade for Christ, took a survey to find out what percentage of Christians in America regularly share their faith with others. Can anyone guess what percentage that was? Very good. I said that like it was a good thing. That's, that's not. 2% of professing Christians regularly share their faith with others. A high percentage of Christians have neglected the duty of evangelism and instead have shifted the task to someone else. Do you know the name of that person? No? No? Actually, I just said the name. Someone else. Someone else will share the gospel with him. Someone else will share the gospel with her. Jesus said, the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. An unfortunate fact is that when you walk out these doors, the average non-Christian is much more prepared to hear the gospel than the average Christian is prepared to share it. And even if we are well prepared, there's still a fear factor to some degree. But why is that? It's because evangelism in general is spiritual warfare. Think about it. How many people does Satan want you to share the gospel with? Zero. And we are going to have some type of fear to some level. Even if you really get used to doing evangelism, you have a little bit of fear. Of course, if you have never done it before, you might have a lot of fear. But the last thing that Satan wants you to do is to actually share the gospel. And today you're going to learn many tools to do that with. The Bible says God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. In fact, if fear is going to be in the equation, we can actually use it to our benefit. Because the Bible says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and the beginning of wisdom. And Jesus said, do not fear those who can kill the body but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Our love for God and our love for others and our concern for their eternal salvation should be much greater than our fear of men. So I say, listen to Jesus. And that's a popular motto, actually. How many of you have seen the bracelets, WWJD, what would Jesus do? That's a great question, especially when it comes to evangelism. But there's a more important question that we need to ask first. And that is, how do you know what Jesus would do if you don't know what Jesus did? Now, that would probably have to be a necklace instead of a bracelet. But since Jesus was the perfect role model when it comes to evangelism, let's look at evangelism in the life of Christ. In the four Gospels, there are approximately 89 accounts of Jesus doing evangelism. Twelve of those 89 fall under the green category, and 77 of them are under the red. Now, why are the two different colors here? Can anyone guess what those two different colors represent? One of those represents friendship evangelism, quote-unquote, or evangelism amongst people who you've met before, family, friends, co-workers, etc. And one of these is evangelism among strangers who you've never met before. So which color represents which group? Which one of these represents friendship evangelism? The green. 13.5% of people who Jesus witnessed to are people who he knew. Now, technically, because he was the eternal son of God in human flesh, he technically knew everyone, right? He knew their minds, he knew their hearts, but 13.5% of people 
had met him before. They knew, oh yeah, that's Jesus. Where 86.5 was like, who's this guy? You know, they didn't know who he was at all. Obviously, he still knew them though. So 86.5% of Jesus' evangelist encounters fall under the evangelism among strangers category. And we see a similar representation here in the book of Acts when we look at the evangelistic efforts of Jesus' disciples and the early church. 17% is friendship evangelism. 83% evangelism among strangers. So what is this telling us? The primary method of evangelism in the New Testament was evangelism among strangers. This isn't saying that friendship evangelism is bad or wrong. Obviously, Jesus and the disciples did practice that. However, there are people out there who say, oh, friendship evangelism is the right way to do evangelism, or you have to earn the right to share the gospel with somebody. They have to deal with these biblical facts. So we do want to do friendship evangelism, but we also want to be confident to do evangelism among strangers. And why is that? Think about it. Which group do you have more to lose if you say something wrong and offend someone, quote unquote, someone who you've never met before and will never see again, or your family member, your neighbor, your coworker, etc. Which group do you have more to lose with, right? So it's good to get used to doing evangelism all the time with whoever, whenever, especially people who you don't know, and that'll actually give you practice to reach people who you do know. So, never underestimate the effectiveness of witnessing to a complete stranger. And why do I say that? Well, I want to take all of you back to 2004. Because I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I never went to church with my parents in my entire life. I never read the Bible. The only time I talked about God and they talked about God is when we were taking his name in vain. That was it. I was at work one day in 2004. A customer came up to me and asked me where something was. I told him. He said, thanks. Oh, here. This is for you. And he handed me what I thought was a business card because I got those pretty regularly. But actually, it was an IQ test. And it said, read this sentence. And it gave me the sentence there in the yellow box. And it says, now count aloud the Fs. F is in Frank. Count them only once. Do not look back and count them again. If you think you are right, look on the back. So everyone go ahead and read the Fs in that box and then just say out loud whatever amount of Fs that you got. Go ahead and say it out loud so everybody can hear. Three, four, five, six. Any other numbers? Five, okay. There are six. Most people find only three. Here's another intelligence test. Answer yes or no out loud. Is there a God? Does God care about right and wrong? Are God's standards the same as ours? Will God punish sin? Is there a hell? Do you avoid hell by living a good life? The answers are yes, yes, no, yes, yes, no. You can't afford to be wrong. Find out the truth. Ask God to forgive your sins, then trust Jesus Christ. The wages of sin is death, but Jesus took your punishment by dying on the cross for you. Then he rose from the dead. Read the Bible daily and obey what you read. God will never let you down. RayComfort.com. And I had two thoughts at that moment. The first one was, who in the heck is Ray Comfort? That's like a silly name. I've, I've, and, and I'm like, okay, what's up with this number six here? Do you avoid hell by living a good life? I was like, I, I think so. I'm a good person. I've done more good than bad. If I died today, I think I'd go to heaven because I actually believe in God. I've heard about Jesus. I think he, was, I think he died on the cross. I don't deny that. But I think I'd go to heaven because I think God is good and he'll let me into heaven. So I went home because this intrigued me and I didn't go home because it intrigued me, but when I, it intrigued me. When I got home, I went to raycomfort.com, and it forwarded me to the way of the master, and Kirk Cameron came on. And he says, are you a Christian? Yeah, if you are, click yes. If not, click no. There's an important part of the site I want you to see. No, I actually clicked yes for the exact reasons that I just told you. 
I was obviously a nominal Christian in name only. I wasn't an atheist. I didn't say, oh, there is no God, but I didn't, I, I didn't do any, I didn't even come to church, right? I was just starting to read the Bible a little bit as like a self-reformation kind of thing. Anyway, it started talking about their ministry. And I was like, I wonder what happens if you click no. So I backed up and I hit no, and Kurt came back on again and said, almost everyone thinks they're a good person. The question you should be asking is, am I good enough to go to heaven? How would you know? The way to find out is to ask yourself if you obeyed the Ten Commandments. So let's go through them and see how you do. So I started the good person test, and it brought up the first commandment. I'm the Lord your God, you should know their gods before me. But it didn't just list the commandment, it actually explained it. And then it had an innocent button and a guilty button. And you had to click one of those in order to go to the next commandment. So when I read the explanation of it, I was like, oh yeah, I guess I've broken that one. He hasn't always been first in my life. So I went to the second commandment. You should not create for yourself a graven image. And I'm like, oh yeah, I haven't done that. I don't worship any statues or anything. But then it said, who is God to you? Is he an all-loving God who would just let, you know, wouldn't send anyone to hell, will just send everybody to heaven? If that's true, then that God doesn't exist. He's a figment of your imagination. You may call it your personal belief, but God calls it idolatry. And the Bible says idolaters will not enter the kingdom of heaven. So I ended up hitting guilty on that one. The third commandment, you should not take the Lord, name of the Lord your God in vain. Like I said, that's the only time I talked about God is when I'm taking his name in vain. So I hit guilty there. The fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And I never asked, well, what does God require of me just as a human or anything? Um, I click guilty on that one. The fifth commandment, honor your father and mother. Explain that one. I was like, oh, I've broken that all, 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 all the time. So I hit guilty. The sixth commandment, you should not murder. And I was like, okay, finally, I'm good on this one. I haven't ever murdered anybody, killed anybody on accident, anything. But then it let me know that Jesus said whoever hates his brother is a murderer and that God sees hatred as murder. So I'm like, okay, great. So I hit guilty on that one. The seventh, you should not commit adultery. I was like, okay, I'm definitely good here because I haven't ever been married. But then it said what Jesus said, that if you look with lust, you've already committed adultery in your heart. So I hit guilty on that. Eighth commandment, you should not steal. I was like, yeah, I've done that before. Ninth commandment, you shall not lie. I've done that a whole lot. Tenth commandment, you shall not covet. And it said, you know, if you desire something that belongs to someone else and aren't grateful for what God's already given you, then that's coveting what they have. So I hit guilty on that. So I'm like, great. So I hit guilty on every single one. So I'm thinking, I'm going to hell in a handbasket. And I'm, and I'm reading it here where it's actually giving me verses about hell. But before it gave me the verses about hell, it asked me, if God judged me on the, on the day of uh, judgment, if he judged me by that standard, would I be innocent or guilty? I actually clicked guilty. So would God send you to, should he send you to heaven or hell? And I put, well, I guess hell, because that makes sense if I'm guilty. And then it just talked about the verses about hell, letting me know that it is a real place. Jesus talked more about hell than he did about heaven. And it got me concerned for the first time in my life, like, man, I've sinned against God. And then it gave the gospel. The gospel is good news, but you know what? The good news makes more sense when you realize the bad news first. And that's what happened in my bedroom that day. And it was that day that I repented and put my trust in Jesus Christ. And I thought, wow, how many people in the world are like me, where they think they're right with God for some super, superficial reason, but they're not. And right away, I had a heart for the lost, for family, for friends, for coworkers, and just random people who I never met. So I ended up buying the tracks and buying the DVDs. A couple of years later, I went down south to meet Ray and Kirk, and I met other people from around the world who wanted to go out and just do biblical evangelism on Huntington Beach, Hollywood Boulevard, Santa Monica Boulevard, etc. So we went out open air preaching, witnessing one to one, witnessing to groups, and using tracks. Now think about it, folks. I didn't go to church and hear a sermon. I didn't do an altar call. No one told me some prayer to recite as if that had some magical formula. A complete stranger said five words. Here, 
this is for you. And he walked away. I don't remember what he looked like. I know he had brown hair. I do remember that. And he was taller than me, which doesn't narrow it down much. But what I do know is that God worked with the seed that that man planted for God's glory. So don't just take my word for it about tracks. George Whitfield, probably the greatest open-air preacher since the Apostle Paul, was saved after reading a gospel track. Charles Spurgeon, widely known as the Prince of Preachers, said, let each one of us, if we've done nothing for Christ, begin to do something now. The distribution of gospel tracts is the first thing. When preaching and private talk are not available, you need to have a tract ready. Get good, striking tracts or none at all. But a touching gospel tract may be the seed of eternal life. Therefore, do not go out without your tracts. There's a real service of Christ in the distribution of the gospel in its printed form, a service the result of which heaven alone shall disclose and the judgment day alone discover. How many thousands have been carried to heaven instrumentally upon the wings of these tracks, none can tell. Now here's a testimony. I want you to try to guess who this is. A young 17-year-old read a gospel tract entitled The Finished Work of Christ. After reading the tract, the young man became a Christian and then went on to faithfully serve a savior for many years in China. Who was that? Hudson Taylor, founder of the China Inland Mission, and at his death, it included 205 mission stations, 800 missionaries, and 125,000 Chinese Christians. And that all started with a gospel tract. Because God can use tracts to save people, we should be regularly giving tracts to people. Why should you use tracts? Number one, they can work while you sleep. Number two, they can never compromise their message. They say what needs to be said, and that's it. They can go places where you cannot, which is great. They're never afraid or show cowardice like we can sometimes. They never, also, they never get tired, discouraged, or give up, which we could also do. And they can present the message when you, do, you don't have time. Now, after being involved in evangelism among strangers for about 19 years now, I'm pretty comfortable witnessing to anyone, anywhere, anytime. But as an evangelist, I still think to myself, where can I leave a tract where someone will find it? Without me even saying those five words, where can I just leave them so that someone can read it for God's glory? The better question is, where should you not leave tracks? Because you can pretty much leave them wherever you want to, as you see there. Elevators, rental DVDs and games, return library books, magazine, newspaper racks, ATMs, bank deposits, slip areas, shopping carts, multi-pack items at the store. I know of a guy years ago who'd go down the beer aisle and stick a track like in every single one of them, you know. So I got the good news with his uh, liquid courage, you know. Um, where else can you leave tracks? Hotel rooms, laundromats, I mean, any place where people are going to be is a good place to leave a track. If you go on a train, taxi, airplane, where there's books at the, at the store, and I see it there at the end with a generous tip, or in menu, napkin holder, etc. Why is, why do I have generous there in red and in, in big letters? <laughs> it's because, unfortunately, there are Waiters and waitresses out there who dread Sundays because they say, oh yeah, Christians, they never tip at all, or they give little, little, little tips, whatever. Christians should be the biggest tippers. And you know what? A good tip and a gospel tract with it is going to set you apart from all those people who never tip and all the people who do tip but have never given them the gospel along with it. And I was in Dearborn, Michigan one time, which is the Muslim capital in the United States as far as population. And a friend and I were at a, a restaurant, and our waitress had a hijab on, and I, we just kind of made small talk with her, because I know she was real busy and stuff, but I left, you know, at least a 30% tip, if not more, and then I gave her a, are you a good person tract in Arabic, and then I also gave her the, you know, the old 1970s Jesus film, so it was that on DVD, but it also had sub, uh, the entire movie was actually in Arabic language, you know, they had languages in multiple different languages. So I left that for her, but just another idea. In general, though, just feel free to be, you know, be creative in where you leave gospel tracts. This is one other example. What is this here? Not an ATM. Gas pump. So that's what it looks like when I show up, and that's what it looks like when I leave. Because the next person that comes and gets gas has to pull out the gospel tract 
to put their debit card or credit card in. And this IQ, this is just another one of the IQ tests here. You get about 100 of these for like $3. So, in addition to all these different places, where is the best place to put a gospel track? I read, I read your lips. <laughs> in someone's hand. Very good. So after getting used to and comfortable with just leaving tracks and saying nothing at all, because that's the first baby step, you can't get less intimidating than leaving a track, right? That should be easy to do. So the next step is to just say those few words like that customer said to me. And you can use that as an icebreaker to just start a full conversation. Or you can just give one out, like say you're at a, at a store, the cashier. You got a line of people behind you. They don't have an hour to talk with you. You don't have an hour to talk with them. But what could you do? Hey, you're doing a great job. Here's something for you to read when you go on break. Is that hard? And give them a gospel track? Obviously, you can get Halloween-themed tracks that you can have with your can't. See, a lot of people say, oh, I don't celebrate Halloween. I'm a Christian. Instead, we redeem Halloween, and we have candy, and we have Halloween-themed million-dollar bills. So we're putting a million-dollar bill gospel track in every single bag that we're putting candy in on Halloween. I mean, you figure... That's the one day each year you may have hundreds of people coming to your house expecting to get something from you, right? So go ahead and give them the gospel along with the candy. Or you get Christmas-themed million-dollar bills. And you can say two words from the day after Thanksgiving, Black Friday, all the way through Christmas. It's the longest holiday track season of the year. Because all I have to say is, Merry Christmas. And guess what? The love of money is the root of all evil. So people love the million-dollar bill gospel tracks. They, they are usually asking for more. You can just put a, a track of million-dollar tr- uh, tracks in your, in your shirt pocket and just go about your day. You know, notice that people start looking at your pocket more than your face because they're like, is, is that real money? You know, say, no, they're gospel tracks. Did you get one yet? And that's what you want to ask. So if I, if I asked, do you want one, what could they say? Now tell me no again. Did you get one of these yet? Oh, this is for you then. So it's not, do you want, but did you get? Because they, if they feel like they're missing out on it, then they do want it anyway, right? So that's the magic question to ask, is did you get one of these yet? The primary thing to remember is that gospel tracks work. And they are one of the most powerful yet simple tools that you can use. So stock up on gospel tracks so that you always have them ready. And these three websites right here, livingwaters.com, onemilliontracks.com, and trackplanet.com, are the three best places to get tracks online because all of these sites use the law to bring the knowledge of sin, and then it shares the gospel. So it's a full gospel presentation, and it's not just a, you know, Jesus loves you and God has a wonderful plan for your life. If that's all it says, there's no knowledge of sin. They, don't need, they don't, haven't realized what they need to repent from. So you want a full presentation, law and gospel. And we'll talk about that more here in a bit. Now, let's say you had tracks and you just ran out. Does that mean, oh, I can't start conversations now. I don't have any tracks on me. No, you should be able to do that as well. So how can you just start a, a, a conversation with a complete stranger? Well, remember the acronym FORM, F-O-R-M. The classic acronym is Family, Occupation, Recreation, and Motivation. In other words, what is a question you can ask a complete stranger in the topic of family? Anyone? What was that? Do you have children? Very good. Anything else? Are you married? Yes. And also, it says friends there because you can also talk about friends. That would be just family, you know. How about occupation? What's a question you can ask a complete stranger? What do you do for work? Yeah, anything, okay? Recreation, what do you do for fun? What do you do when you're not working? What do you do on weekends, etc.? And of course, religion. Now, if you ask a religious question, like, hey, do you have any type of spiritual background? I mean, you've already swung to the spiritual. You aren't in the natural with these other, other topics and have to swing to it. So uh, religion is obviously available there. And also motivation, you know, like, um, you know, at the gym, you know, so why, why are you working out? You know, what are your goals at the gym? What, I mean, anything, okay? F-O-R-M, remember those words, and those are subjects you can just bring up a conversation when you're talking with someone. Now, how do you stay in control 
of any conversation. This is how you do it. Listen well and ask questions. Now, that may seem kind of odd. Like, well, why am I asking questions? I have the gospel to give. I have information to give if I know apologetics and so on. That is great. But here's why you should be asking questions. But in general, here's how you stay in control of any conversation. Here's why you should ask questions. Number one, it invites the other person to participate. If they don't have time, they'll let you know. But guess what? If they reciprocate and they do talk, guess what? A conversation is now going, and it's your job to stay in control of that conversation. But also, asking questions, as long as you want to do it, keeps you in a neutral zone. You aren't preaching, quote-unquote, if you're asking about them. And guess what? Interested seems interesting. So if you're asking them questions about themselves, guess what? A lot of people love to talk about themselves. So they'll keep talking as long as you keep asking questions. You can also gain and clarify information. If they said, oh, I don't believe this or I believe that, ask a follow-up question to gain information or to clarify it. So to gain information, these would be questions you could ask. Do you have any type of religious background? What do you think happens after we die? Do you think there's an afterlife? What do you think about blank? Now, you don't want to say blank. You want to put something in there. You know, it could be a recent movie that came out or whatever. I remember one time years ago, I was at a neighbor's house, and his teenage, I was helping him with his computer, and his teenage sons were watching Assassin's, or not watching, playing a video game called Assassin's Creed II. And I start hearing them these different things that they're saying, like, oh, go back into the Vatican. Oh, go, go grab the codex. And I was like, codex? Like, as in a Bible? And they're like, what do you mean? And 10 minutes later, the video game was paused. His two sons and their teenage friend were standing next to their dad and myself, and I was sharing information of how the Bible's reliable, and we know that it hasn't been changed and all of that. And how did that start? Because I was on the lookout and on the listen out for opportunities to plant seeds and start spiritual conversations and all that. So... That's just an example of to be aware of what people are saying, and that blank can be filled in with whatever you want to ask. Also, ask about jewelry or tattoo. Now, how many people are out there wearing a crucifix pendant who haven't actually repented and put their trust in Christ? It was a gift, or they just like it, or maybe they're nominal Christian, etc. So, even if someone says, I'm a, yeah, I'm a Christian... I always follow up on that because there's been a ton of people who I've asked, oh, yeah, and they say, I'm a Christian, and then I say, oh, like, so how did that happen? And I'm like, what do you mean? And I was like, like, so when did you become a Christian? What happened? And it's like, oh, well, I just grew up in the church, and I, and I know the books of the Bible, and I sang songs, and we get down to the nitty-gritty of, okay, have you actually repented and put your trust in Christ? But before I even ask that, I take them through the law, and there's been many people who said that they were Christians, and guess what? They've come to realize I'm not a Christian because I've never repented and put my trust in Christ, and now they're interested in doing that because guess what? They heard the bad news, and now they appreciate the good news. So if someone has a pendant, a necklace, that's a great time to start a conversation. Like you see this guy at the beach, you should <laughs> ask him a question, you know? Like what can he ask? Like, hey, is, that, is there like religious significance to that, or is that just jewelry, you know? But use, use jewelry to start a conversation. Or a tattoo. If someone has a tattoo, like this one here, look. Only after I walk through hell have I seen the gates of heaven. Now, how unbiblical is that? But guess what? He just started the spiritual conversation with that tattoo. So you can just ask him about that, and the conversation's going. Or this one here, pretty artistic, 3D-ish looking tattoo. But there are many people out there who have Christian, quote-unquote, or spiritual-type tattoos who have not actually repented and put their trust in Christ, which means they're still in their sin, which means they're not saved. So use these different things to ask questions. Now, as I said, you can clarify information. And this is the best question to clarify what someone just said. What do you mean by blank? And you already know, don't say, right, you want to fill that in with what they just said. If they say, oh, I don't believe in God. Well, what do you mean by God? 
And they say, oh, some high and mighty figure who just sends you to hell because you don't believe in him. You say, oh, I don't believe in that God either. But if you don't ask the question, you don't know what they mean by God. You don't know if they're just, you know, if they're, if, what God they have in mind and so on. So what do you mean by blank? Now, you don't want to just clarify information in order to, to be on the same page with them, but also because of the burden of proof. And the burden of proof rule is another reason why you should ask questions. So what is the burden of proof rule? The responsibility that a person has to defend or give evidence for his statement or view. How many people get away with saying something, and then we're just like, oh, I, I don't know what to say, or... And, and then, or if you do say something, then they'll say, oh, well, and then they turn the tables on you, expecting you to give them evidence or whatever else. But the burden of proof lies on the person who makes the claim. If someone says the Bible's been changed over and over again, you could have all the information in the world of knowing that it hasn't, but why feel like you need to give that? You ask them, what do you mean by changed? Keep the burden of proof on them. You don't have to give any information until you make a statement. And that is when you need to be able to back it up, right? So burden of proof questions to ask people. They say something. How did you come to that conclusion? What does that make them do? Back up what they just said. What evidence do you have for that? Where do you get your information? How do you know that is true? Oh, I don't know, I just heard it from my uncle. That gets exposed and becomes known when you keep the burden of proof on them. Why do you think that's true? Any of these questions that you ask them, they bear the responsibility to back up. But guess what? Only if you purposely keep the burden of proof on them. Does that make sense? As soon as you make a statement like, oh, Jesus died and rose from the dead, who bears the burden of proof? I do, because I just said that. Or you do, if you said that, and so on. So you stay in control of the conversation by asking questions, keeping the burden of proof on them, and so on. Now, don't be surprised if someone gives you a blank stare if you ask them one of these questions. And that is because they've never been made to back up what they've said before. You're the first person to ever do that. So go ahead and be the first person in many people's lives. See, many people are very happy to give their opinion or view, but they are not prepared to back up their opinion or view with actual evidence. So by asking questions, you can stay in control of the conversation. It keeps you in a neutral zone. You can gain information, clarify information, keep the burden of proof on them. And more, the, in, the more information that you have, the more strategic you can be in what you say to the person. Now, when you're gaining information, you are assuming less you're not assuming if you're asking, right? And they're backing that up. So you're finding out more. But you can also expose faulty thinking. And people make self-defeating statements all the time, and, they, and the pressure's never kept on them to back it up. But you can expose all of these statements here. There is no truth. Ever heard anyone say that? There is no truth? If someone says there is no truth, what question should you ask them? Is that true? Because then it's true that there's no truth. It's a self-contradictory statement, right? How about you shouldn't judge? Rather than why not, why are you judging me then? Every one of these is a self-defeating statement if you word it correctly. All truth is relative. The word itself can be one of the words in each of these sentences can be used to spin back on them to keep the pressure on them. Is that a relative truth? God doesn't take sides. Would God take your side on that? Would God agree with you on that? Because then he's taking a side, right? And you, you know what we're saying here? These are all self-defeating statements. There are no absolutes. Or there are no absolute truths. Is that absolutely true? Only science can give us truth. The problem with that is that's not a scientific claim. There's never been a scientific experiment letting us know that only science can give us truth. That isn't a scientific claim, it's a philosophical claim. You can't, all, you can't know anything for sure. 
What could he ask? Do you know that for sure? And that's true for you, but not for me. Some of you have had to have heard that one. Is that true for you, but not for me, true for everybody? Because if not, then it's true for you, but not for me. can't be true. So, when a statement fails to meet its own standard, it is a self-defeating statement. Why should you ask questions? You can also give information in the form of a question. And you can say that, do that by, did you know that? And then give them some information. Have you ever thought about, and then give them some information? But guess what? You have to have the information in order to give it, right? That's where the study time comes in. Because what happens when someone has a question for you? You, need to, you should be able to answer that. As 1 Peter 3.15, always be prepared to give a defense or a reason for the hope that lies within you, but do it with gentleness and respect. Being able to do that effectively comes with the quality study time. So what should you read? Obviously, read the Bible, because that'll help your mind be saturated with God's word. You'll have better discernment. You'll be able to recall verses better. You'll be able to spot when someone takes a verse out of context, and so on. Also, read good books like systematic theology, to get a scholarly overview of what the entire Bible has to say about a particular topic of Christianity. Church history, so you can know that, you can know how we got to where we are today, and that we're, our faith isn't just another option in the marketplace of ideas, but that we stand on the shoulders of giants. Apologetics, so again, as 1 Peter 3.15 says, be able to give a defense when necessary. And philosophy, now, that's kind of surprising sometimes. And people say, hey, doesn't the Bible say, you know, philosophy is bad? No, it's saying that worldly philosophy according to the traditions of men. But even C.S. Lewis said, good philosophy must exist if for no other reason because bad philosophy needs to be answered. Last but not least, we want to read and teach your children and grandchildren, logic and critical thinking skills. In most public schools today, children aren't taught how to think, they're taught what to think. And as I said to a gentleman this morning, youth group is great, Awana is great, VBS is great. But you know what? All of those great things should technically be supplements to what's happening in the home. The parent needs to share the gospel with the child. The grandparents need to share the gospel with the child. And, again, be able to do apologetics when necessary. Charles Spurgeon said, study yourself to death and then pray yourself alive. Dr. Wynn Cordwin said, never stop your mind from loving the Lord as much as your heart does. Most importantly, Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. After you have this information, you want to reflect on it. What did someone ask me the other day and I didn't know the answer to it? And whenever that happens, just let them know, can I get back to you on that? Can I give you a call tomorrow or next week or send you an email, whatever? But if you say, I'm not sure, let me get back to you, that lets them know that you're interested in continuing the conversation. It takes the pressure off of you so you can go and look it up or whatever else. And it lets them know you want to continue it and that you're gonna get the answer, and I guarantee you that if you look up the answer to something that you don't know, you're going to remember that answer more than perhaps other things that you just, oh yeah, I know about that, but you didn't actually look it up. So reflect on what you could do better next time, what you can say differently and so on, and that also comes part of the preparation as well. So, we as Christians are called to evangelize the world and defend the historic Christian faith. Doing apologetics allows us to destroy the intellectual walls and barriers that people have, which clears the path to share the gospel clearly and effectively. If we are Christians, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10.5, we are to destroy speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. However, when you walk out these doors and you walk down the street, go to work, go to school, go to the gym, you won't hear good arguments against Christianity for the most part. But what will you hear? Many speculations, which we are called to do what? Destroy. And you'll hear many subjective opinions that oppose the Christian worldview. 
So what might you hear? You might hear someone say, oh, there's no God, and I believe in Darwinian evol- uh, evolution. But in Romans 1, 18 through 20, Paul says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. Now the word creation here is referring to everything that began to exist. We read in Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. If God was there at the beginning, he had to have been there before the beginning. If not, then he would have had to exist in order to be able to give himself existence, which doesn't make sense, right? God is not bound by space, time, or physical objects because he is spaceless, timeless, and immaterial. Now, you and I are not any of those things. There's a time when all of us did not exist. And everyone and everything that has ever existed falls into one of these three categories, uncaused, self-caused, or caused by someone else. Now, as I already said, it's impossible for something or someone to be self-caused. If I said, oh yeah, I created myself, that's what people are saying when they're saying, oh, you know, yeah, that's what God did, he created himself, or where did God come from? So let's take that out of the equation. No one can, nothing and no one can be self-caused. So all we have left is uncaused and caused by someone else. So we exist because we have parents who had parents who had parents who had parents. goes right back to Adam and Eve. Now, either the universe always existed or something outside the universe always existed. But if the universe is expanding and stars are burning out, the sun's running out of energy, etc., all those things couldn't have been happening forever. Why? Because the sun and all the stars would have already burned out by now. And if you go in reverse, everything kind of comes back to an origin point, right? Kind of like there was a big bang, which is just fine because we know who banged it, right? So when it comes to creation, Paul wrote in Romans 1, what he wrote there lines right up with a psalmist who said in Psalm 19:1, the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky displays his handiwork. But so does a tree. How is that? The tree hasn't always existed either. How do we know that? Because it changes. It can grow, it can get taller, wider, and it can die. But in the meantime, it does exactly what God designed it to do. The tree didn't always exist, and because of that, something had to give it existence. The tree has existence, but God is existent. He never received existence because he is existence itself. So the tree declares the glory of God who created it. How about the common claim that you can't trust the Bible? That book's been changed over and over again. Now, based on what we already covered, if someone says the Bible's been changed, what's the precise question you should ask? What do you mean by changed? And they say, oh, well, you know, each Bible must have come from the one before it. And if you ask, well, what do you mean by that? They'll say, oh, well, there was a King James and then a New New American Standard, then an NIV, NKGV, ESV, ESV, etc. So they're assuming something that's false because every single translation came from actual Hebrew and Greek manuscripts, not the translation before it. Now we can do apologetics as much or as little as necessary, but overall we need to keep our eyes on the prize and that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. So what tool can we use to help the gospel make sense? At some point in the conversation, We can strategically swing from the natural to the spiritual and from the intellect to the conscience. In Romans 2, 15 and 16, Paul tells us that the law is written upon our hearts, that our conscience bears witness, and our own thoughts accuse us. And because God knows our hearts and our thoughts, on the day of judgment, he will judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. Now what does Paul mean when he said the law is written upon our hearts? In Romans 3, 19 and 20, he says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be closed and all the world may be kept accountable to God, because the works of the law, by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. 
for all of, all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. And he says in Romans 7, 7, I would not have come to know sin except through the law. For I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, you shall not covet. What commandment is that? Commandment number 10. Paul's referring to the 10 commandments. As I said earlier, I was taken through the law, realized the bad news, and then all of a sudden the good news makes sense. I never appreciated the Savior because I never realized my need for one until I learned the bad news. So Exodus chapter 20 and Deuteronomy chapter 5 are where you can find the law in Scripture. And we actually have a resource that we want to make available to you that will allow you to memorize the Ten Commandments in about three minutes and teach it to your children and grandchildren as well. Because knowing the commandments lets you know what you've done wrong, what, what sins you've committed against God. Also, it allows you to use the law when you're doing evangelism yourself. So you want to know the commandments. And Jesus used the Ten Commandments when he did evangelism. Here are some quick examples. Matthew 5, 21, 22, 27, 28, Jesus said, You've heard the ancients were told you should not commit murder. And the next verse is here, you shall not commit adultery. He just used the sixth and the seventh commandments when he was witnessing. Matthew 15, 19, and 20. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, and so on. He just used the sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth commandments. Mark 10, 17 through 22, when he's talking with the rich young ruler. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud on your father and mother. Jesus just used the 6th, 7th, 8th, ninth, and 5th commandments in that order. It wasn't just Jesus. Paul, Stephen, James, John the Baptist, Jude, they all used the law to bring the knowledge of sin and then preach the gospel. Because this is the principle that Jesus used. Law to the proud, grace to the humble. Jesus never gave the gospel to a proud, self-righteous arrogant sinner. He gave him the law. But when someone called him Lord, and he hadn't even you know, died and, and rose yet, but they knew who he was, he didn't say, oh, well, let's see how many commandments you've broken, and then take him through the law. No, he would give him grace. Law of the proud, grace of the humble. And you can use this in biblical evangelism as well. We talked about WWJD earlier. Switch up. WDJD. And this lets you know where you are in the conversation. It doesn't need to be cookie cutter, but just keep this in mind. Would you consider yourself to be a good person? As the Bible says, almost every man will proclaim his own goodness. I guarantee you, at least eight out of ten people will say, yeah, I'm a good person. Can I ask you a few questions to see if that's true? Oh, sure, go ahead. You think you've kept the Ten Commandments? That's the D. No, oh, pretty much. I've never, heard, I've never killed anybody. Can I ask you a few questions to see if that's true? Sure, go ahead. How many lies have you told in your life? Uh, I don't know. I lost count. What do you call someone who's lost count of how many lies they've told? A uh, liar? You've ever stolen something? Yeah. What do you call someone who steals things? A uh, stealer. So I've got to tell them that they're in Pittsburgh and that if you steal, you're actually a thief, right? And, you know, you used to ask me to use God's name in vain. Yeah, you know, someone that's called blasphemy, you know, it's really a serious sin. Uh, have you ever looked with lust? Yeah, all the time. Uh, Jesus said, if you look with lust, you committed adultery in your heart. So what's your name again? Uh, John? Well, John. By your own admission, you're a lying thief and a blasphemous adulterer at heart, and you have to face God on Judgment Day. So, if you die today and stand before God, would you be innocent or guilty of breaking His commandments? Well, I'd be guilty. So, should God send you to heaven or hell? Uh, heaven. Why? I think God's good. He's going to let me go. Okay, if you're sitting before a judge and all the evidence was there, and the judge did everything to say for yourself, and you say, oh yeah, Your Honor, I think you're a good man, you're going to let me go. What's the judge going to say? Well, you're right, I am a good man. Because I'm a good man, I'll make sure that you're punished for what you've done. And if you say, well, I'm sorry. Well, you should be sorry. You broke the law. If it won't work in a human courtroom with a, with a, a fallible human judge, how much more is it not going to work with the judge of the universe? If you're guilty, you deserve hell. You can actually take them and talk about hell, just like as Jesus did. But guess what? That is what's going to make them think, oh, man. For the first time in my life, I've just realized that I personally sinned against God. And that's the perfect, because the Holy Spirit will convict people. I, I'm telling you, I've, hundreds and hundreds of people over the years, faces get red, eyes get watery within minutes. I've never talked to them before, but guess what? I'm using the law to bring the knowledge of sin. The Holy Spirit is convicting them, and that's when they appreciate the gospel. And it all of a sudden makes sense. So... After destiny, heaven, or hell, 
And again, that's when you share the gospel. So we're finishing up here. We gotta make sure we know what the gospel is not. The gospel is not being nice to people. Anybody can be nice to people. Atheists can be nice to people. Sharing your testimony, that's great, but guess what, it's not the gospel. Your testimony is subjective. Your testimony is different than mine, but what's the same? The gospel. We've repented and put our trust in Christ, or we haven't. All of our testimonies are different. Though. Following the golden rule, you know, whatever that is subjectively defined as, inviting someone to church, that's great, but what if they never show up? If you're expecting Pastor Jeff to share the gospel, and they never show up, guess what? Pastor Jeff can't share the gospel with him. And I guarantee you, a lot of people out there will never walk into this church unless they become a Christian first. And they're like, oh, what church should I go to? How do you reach them? Using tracts, using your words, whatever you want to do outside these doors here. Having a relationship with God. Well, everybody does, even Satan does. So it's not a real healthy relationship there, right? But it's a relationship. Telling someone God loves you, Jesus loves you. Yes, that's true. But how did God ultimately express his love? It was through the cross and what Christ did. And last but not least, share the gospel if necessary, use words. Okay, that's like saying feed the hungry if necessary, use food. Okay, you need food to feed the hungry. You need words to share the gospel. Is anyone here fluent in sign language? Raise your hand. One person. One person? Okay. So that person right there is the only person in this room who can share the gospel by his actions. Sign language, right? Other than that, we have to use words. Gospel tract words, gospel of John words, complete Bible words, or just our own words when we're sharing the gospel with people. Gospel means good news. Paul proclaimed it in 1 Corinthians 15. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas, then to his twelve disciples. After that, he appeared to more than 500 people at one time. And he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and to Paul himself. So how can we know and understand the gospel? How can people know it and come to understand it? That's where we kind of do. We have creation and the conscience on our side to help steer the conversation towards Christ. But we have to make that effort to reach out to people and tell them about him. We need to tell people who he is, what he did, and how he himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. We have to be willing to step out of our comfort zone, out of our love for God and our love for people, and our concern for their eternal salvation. And there should also be a sense of urgency on our part as well. I can tell you that because of a, fam a very famous preacher. I want you to try to guess who this famous preacher is. This preacher speaks more boldly than all others. He's not popular, though the world is his parish and he travels every part of the globe and he speaks in every language. He visits the poor, he calls upon the rich, he preaches to people of every religion and no religion. And the subject of his sermon is always the same. He's an eloquent preacher, often stirring feelings which no other preacher could. And he brings tears to the eyes of those who never weep. His arguments, well, none are able to refute, nor is there any heart that has remained unmoved by the force of his appeals. He shatters life with his message. Most people hate him, and almost everyone fears him. His name? Death. His name is Death. Every tombstone is his pulpit, every newspaper prints his text. And someday, every one of you will be his servant. So what then? Those of us who know Christ will finally be in his presence. But what about those who have never heard the gospel? They've never repented and put their trust in Christ. And Jesus will say, Depart from me, worker of iniquity, I never knew you. The Bible says it's appointed unto man to die once, and after this comes judgment. And after we die, there's no opportunity to share the gospel with those who need to know and understand it. As Christians, our heart cry should be that of the great missionary C.T. Studd, who said this, Only one life will soon be passed, only what's done for Christ will last. And when I'm dying, how happy I'll be if the flame of my life has been burned out for thee. 
Once a person becomes a Christian, God's commission is a lifetime mission. So what does the Bible command people to do after they hear the gospel? Let's make sure we're all on the same page. It doesn't tell anyone to accept Jesus, just believe in Jesus, even demons believe and they tremble, right? Give your life to Christ, have Jesus into your heart, invite Christ into your life, make Jesus Lord and Savior, or say this prayer after me as if there's some kind of magical formula there, or as if the prayer itself saves them. No, it's a repentant heart and putting your trust in Christ. Repent and believe the gospel is found throughout the New Testament. That's what people need to do. The Bible is very clear. So, the mission field is not only a place where there are people who have never heard of Jesus Christ, it's also any place where there are people who have never repented and put their trust in him. So to be a missionary, you know, to cross the sea, you just have to see the cross. And they go across your streets. Jesus turned the world upside down with 12 obedient disciples. With this many people here today, how easy should it be for all of us to continue that trend? I can confidently guarantee you that if you take the tips, tools, tactics, and principles, and biblical truths that I share with you today, and go out and reach people for God's glory, you will see God work the seeds that you plant for his glory. Let's pray.